So while I'm, we're wait, waiting for the blackboard to dry up, let, me, let us review the, what we have <coughs> talked about last uh, hour. Uh, it was summarized in that uh, three lines. So well, in the first part, we solved some exercise regarding the basics of stabilizer code by thinking of uh, projectors. And the reason I put up that exercise was to solidify our memory about the error correction. And, uh, and the method I introduced, what I found, is the simplest one. You, can, you, you may wish to apply to other situations. And then we, uh, uh, to, to achieve the goal to talk about the quantum memories in the quantum information context, I could not uh, but discuss the Tori code. And I first defined the uh, Tori code in terms of Hamiltonian, but soon I turned myself and ourselves to into the language of homology. And uh, the language of homology was introduced like this. We think of a manifold as a triangulated uh, uh, complex. So we think of, of some finite data consisting of triangles, edges, and vertices, and connected in a certain way. And then we introduced uh, very abstract groups called the C1, C, uh, C2, C1, C0. Um, <clears throat> those are formal uh, abelian groups uh, generated by the labels of uh, faces, edges, and vertices. And then we define the so-called boundary maps, or sometimes called chain maps. The boundary maps inherits information about the geometry of how they are connected. And it, uh, it was defined by mimicking what we think of the, what the boundary is. So uh, one, a boundary of a one face consists of face, meaning the triangle. A boundary of the triangle consists of three edges. And a boundary of an edge consists of two points. And, uh, and we endowed another rule that uh, what, whatever two objects appearing together, we just canceled off. So we, we did the arithmetic over the uh, binary field F2. And I insist, well, I emphasize the perspective that the faces here are corresponding to the uh, particular stabilizer operators of, that appears in your Hamiltonian term. And the boundary term uh, explains, given a face, where should I put my poly operators to describe my Hamiltonian term? That was the boundary term from dimension 2 to 1. And the boundary uh, operator from dimension 1 to 0 corresponded to, given the position of poly operators acting on the ground space, where should I find, where would I find the excitations caused by that poly operator? And that association, uh, which, which has a geometry content, is exactly described by that boundary map. And the fact that the stabilizer uh, operator that you had in the Hamiltonian commits with any, everything else is translated to the fact that the composition of two maps results in zero. Because zero in the C0 means that you have, don't have any excitation, and you started with a stabilizer. So commutativity translates to the fact that it is a chain complex. And then we looked at the so-called logical operators. Uh, and what, what's a logical operator? They are some operator that enacts a transformation within your code space. And so by definition, it should commute with the all terms in your Hamiltonian. So it should reside in the kernel of the boundary map of dimension 1 to 0. But we have to mod it out because logical operators come in many shapes because it can be multiplied and deformed by, multiplying, uh, by uh, adjoining by adding or multiplying the stabilizers. But the stabilizers are exactly the image of the boundary map from dimension 2 to 1. So we obtain the expression of set of all logical operators in terms of this homology group. And uh, more quantitatively, uh, the dimension or rank of that homology group was exactly the number of logical qubits. Now, yeah. So the <coughs> when you say stabilize the labels, yeah. In the language of a Tory code, mm -hmm. I mean, you have two types of stabilizers. Ah, uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So this refers to the plaquette one. Plaquette. Yes. Yeah. Every, everything here was only for the plaquette term. And I uh, encourage you to think about the other term by thinking of the dual lattice. Dual lattice. Yeah. So, Uh, 
Y well, yes, yes and uh, no. Because well, <laughs> yes, obviously you have to do it separately because they are separate, distinct objects. But for the Tory code family, uh, actually, there's a more general statement of Pronkite duality that your homology groups have the same rank. Uh, so if you have a dimension 0 and 1, 2, up all the way up to n, then the homology groups have the same rank when you consider ith homology group here and n minus ith one here. So, and the going through the dual lattice is exactly jumping to the other side of this chain. It's just a complementary description? Uh, yeah, well, uh, to making it more precise and is more involved, but essential idea is, is just this. Uh, well, look at the homology in the direct lattice, as you, you would normally do. And the, the, the homology in the dual lattice is, well, is actually translated to the doing in the complementary position. So they will always match. And that's why in the two dimensions, you only have this. So the sigma z part will be homology along this direction, and the sigma x will be homology in that direction. So they always match. Well, that's the actually uh, the e e exact content I'm now going to talk about. So on this language, you might wonder, oh, OK. Well, there was a, yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't understand how uh, uh, C0 corresponds to the position of excitations. I mean, the boundary map delta 1, that maps edges to vertices. Yes. All the qubits live on edges, edges. Right? Yes. So in what sense is can I think about it? What's an excitation? What? What is an excitation? Um, what? Not the ground state. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, that's right. But we t typically, we call that something that is not ground state as an excited state. Yeah. Excitation, by, by excitation, I specifically mean uh, more refined information. Uh, you, you think of the quasi particles in the CAP system. Well, that's a more general theory. But in this stabilizer setting, uh, an excitation is a flipped term in your Hamiltonian. Well, it's like a stabilizer that has like a minus Exactly. But where, does the, where did the stabilizer were defined? It was defined in the association with the face or in the vertex. Those are uh, associated with the faces were treated by the C2 and boundary map 2. And here, at well, since we're talking about the Z operators only, possible excitation will only involve the vertex terms. And to specify where the vertex term is, I only specify for where the vertex is. And C0 is exactly the position of vert vertices. And taking the boundary of the edge make, made sense, because whenever you apply a sigma z on the end and edge, the, the vertex term at the end of that edge will be excited. So this was the connection why we call Tori code as a topological code. It has a topological content. And I, have, and I give you an intuition why the homology group is, is insensitive to the, our triangulation, but only on the manifold itself. Because you can always refine it. And refinement corresponds to some local move that, that's, that's uh, insensitive to other uh, long distance topology. OK. Yeah. In a, in, the in a trivial sense, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, actually, David brought up a good point, which I was about to, well, I was going to discuss yesterday, but I didn't. So let me briefly tell you. How do you, well, if I give you an a assignment that you should ca calculate um, the, the size of the stabilizer group, and I specify the generators of them, how would you solve that? homework. And the, the set of generators does not look like a nice form. It comes with some arbitrary. How would you solve that problem? Well, first thing, as, a, as an instructor, I have to give you a concrete problem. But how would I describe the problem? How would I convey the information of that problem to you? I would write down the poly matrices that generates my stabilizer group. That's my information. But I'm lazy, so I don't want to waste my chalk. 
So I would represent my stabilizers in a binary form. That's perfectly sensible. It's just a different encoding of my, my homework to you. My PDF file might contain this bit information like this. And this bit representation makes sense because all the arithmetic in the poly operators that involves multiplication translates to the addition of this bit, op bit strings modulo 2. I believe you have seen this before. OK. Uh, so all I will hand you will be some bit string of some bit string of uh, that that would describe the poly operators. Each row will correspond to one stabilizer generator. What's the relation among them? Well, if I multiply two poly operators corresponding to two uh, uh, bit string, it will add up, and the big, uh, the 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 result of product being identity translates to the fact that the addition of the rows over Z2 is 0. And so it's a linear algebra problem. And all you have to do to solve my assignment should be to enter this matrix into Mathematica and compute the matrix rank modulo 2. That's it. So I could now think of my assignment as a giant, well, not giant, some uh, large binary matrix, which I denote by S. That's my uh, whole information that I have to convey to you. That's everything. Now, given this information, I want to figure out, uh, starting with the code state, arbitrary code state, and some error acts on that code state, I want to figure out the outcome of my stabilizer measurement to error correct. Um, then I represent another binary vector that would encode the locations of errors. Well, locations of errors are, is modeled by another poly operator, but we have a nice representation in terms of binary bits. So I would write down some <coughs> binary numbers that represents my errors. So in that case, well, uh, <coughs> Sigma x is applied to second qubit. Uh, sigma z is applied to the uh, third qubit, and so on. I want to figure out what the stabilizer outcome will be. But we know that the Pauli operator is a commute or anti-commute. And the phase vector will just accumulate. And the commutation relation is simply obtained by flipping these two bits, look at the overlap, and add them mod 2. So in this, in this particular case, with this first row, um, they commute. They commute. Uh, I should make something non-commuting. So <laughs> let's do it. So this and that anti-commute, and everything else will commute. So I know that this stabilizer should, uh, should tell me the result was minus 1. The exponent of my result is nothing but the, the inner product between the, these two vector, binary vectors with the, with the bit uh, uh, order, uh, reverse understanding, understood. So everything becomes just a linear algebra over the binary field. So in, in analogy with that uh, boundary, first boundary term, how would I describe the measurement outcome given my error representation in binary is simply because just a matrix uh, uh, multiplication table. So now I think of this way. Um, So the co coding theory, the, 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 the set of stabilizer measurement outcome is called syndrome. So I just figured out how to map 
Pauli operator to syndrome by multiplying a binary matrix. That was just uh, my stabilizer matrix. And stabilizer matrix had a one, well, each row corresponded to one stabilizer generator. So it's, this map is nothing but uh, the stabilizer map transposed. It's a linear map because if you give me two generators, then I should multiply two, two stabilizers altogether. And the fact that stabilizer generators themselves should not cause any syndrome, non-trivial syndrome, is translated to the fact that this matrix and that matrix composed map should result in zero. It's, it's almost the same. What about the logical operators? Logical operators are by, are by definition the poly operators that does not make any syndrome. So it's a kernel of this map. And we should mold out that logical operators by the stabilizers. But stabilizers are precisely the image of this map. So again, that expression. So yes, um, any stabilizer code, there is a associated chain complex, although it does not have any uh, geometric or topological interpretation. It does have algebraic interpretation in terms of homology. Ah, very good point. Poly operators do not form an abelian group. True, um, and it must not be abelian. But here we are doing. Um, we intentionally forgot about the commutation relation when you talk about this middle one, and we uh, uh, remember the commutation relation by the trick that you flipped the bits that represented it. So, maybe I reversed the, uh, oh no, I'm, I'm, I'm consistent, yes. So if I encode my poly operators in terms of bit string, then you can recover the commutation relation by reading off the matrix product of this form with the reverse of bit, uh, uh, bit order implemented by this matrix. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. That was a terrible notation. Uh, So indeed, when I think of a binary space, I forgot about the commutation relation to make it abelian group. And we can talk about the homology. But we, we did not forget the fact that they, they do not commute by uh, invoking this symplectic matrix. So yeah, up to that little twist, everything is homology. OK, coming back to this geometrical setting. I want to talk about the higher dimensional analogs of the Tori code. Um, so, yeah. The upper row is a multiplicative notation for the poly matrix. The bottom row is uh, uh, my binary uh, string representation of the poly matrix. You have the binary for the representation of uh, Yeah, I, I did, yeah. Right. So yesterday, Jun Yi uh, talked a wonderful statement. If you understand simple things well enough, then you can do amazing things. So, <laughs> uh, well, given that now this is well understood, we can go to arbitrary dimension that we cannot probably can imagine in our brain, but we can follow the mathematics. So I'm trying to draw the, the three-dimensional cubic lattice. 
uh, but my drawing skill is limited to two-dimensional, so this is my uh, three-dimensional cubic lattice. I want to follow the si similar construction. Um, well, this is three-dimensional cellulation, so I would have see not like this. Well, but as you see there, the stabilizer code or Hamiltonian only involves two maps, not three. So I should well, okay. Let me just focus on this part and forget about that part for the moment. Uh, what's the rule? I assigned. Uh, stabilizer labels to every two cell and then I will write down the actual stabilizer operator not the label operator in the one cells by the boundary association so it means that for each plaquet I define one stabilizer op uh, generator and by the same token it's going to be product of sigma z's around that plaquet how can I design the vertex term? Vertex term should be designed in such a way that upon insertion of uh, sigma z operator on edge, it should create uh, x stations located at the boundary of that edge. Right? So how can I do that? Well, given any edge, I want to create x station here and there. So if both of the operators should involve sigma x operator at that edge. But, well, let's make it simple. So make, let's make it isotropic. Okay, I will put sigma x on every edge where the vertex meet. Okay. Was that, was that clear? So, so, no, so, so, so what happened in 2D again? So in the 2D case, uh, you also have to put No. Uh, in the 2D case, I wanted to interpret this part to be my stabilizer. So starting with the two cell, take the boundary. In this in square lattice, there are four edges. I want them to be a stabilizer. So I just did it like that. And then to design the vertex term, I want vertex term to be interpreted by that map. So given an edge, if I insert sigma z, the boundary of the two edges, no, I'm sorry, the boundary of, the, of that particular edge must be excited. So the other term, sigma x term, should be defined for every vertex, and it should intersect an edge odd number of times. So the, the rational choice was to put X like this. Yeah. Right. As you, this is unique, such a thing. There's no other. Uh, if you insist on the uh, correspondence in this way. I'm doing the same thing, but one dimension higher. Simply ignoring this part for the moment. For every phrase, I define the stabilizer, and I designed vertex term in such a way that every edge uh, uh, operator will excite two vertices. And this is one such. So my Hamiltonian will be Well, now you should ask, well, what happened to this? Well, that one will appear when you think about the dual lattice. Dual lattice means that you map, you associate the Q for each vertex and the face to each edge, an edge for each face, and a vertex for any uh, Q. That's the duality mapping. That's, that's how you construct a dual lattice. So in the dual lattice, these six edges becomes this cube and edge becomes face here and I will place 
x on every face. The, there are three more faces in the, in the background, which I didn't draw. And, and, and you, can, you, can, you can see that now in that dual lattice, this map with respect to that dual lattice becomes the excitation map with respect to the insertion of uh, X operators. Now, what's, what about the number of logical qubits or the, the degeneracy under the torus uh, periodic boundary condition? Well, we all have to do is, all we have to do is just compute the first homology. But I told you that the homology can be computed in the simplest possible way. In a two-dimensional setting, the simplest possible cellulation of to torus was just this one. And in three dimensions, the simplest possible cellulation of the three torus is just a cube with the uh, uh, parallel faces identified. So there are actually um, only uh, one vertex, uh, three edges after the identification of the period boundary condition, and, and three faces and one cube. So, the com com well, in that simplified cellulation, every map becomes just zero, and you can just read off my first homology to be rank three. So that's your number of encoded qubits in the three-dimensional Tori code. Yes. And we can also discard, for example, C0. Uh, very good point. Uh, that's the next thing. Now let's go to the four dimensions. I mean, we're just adding one number, three to four. And, uh, let me not erase. Well, yeah. So again, simple. Yeah. So for the first stabilizer with the Z's. This one, yes. Yeah, so you have that on all faces. All faces, yeah. Then the dual lattice is got associated with edges. Yes. Which doesn't have an interpretation. Oh, oh, yeah, well, you should really think of uh, two separate complexes. And the, yeah, the white, hem white, uh, uh, this is for the Z part, and this is for the X part. You should never view them on the same plane. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I was sloppy on that. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah. <coughs> um, now, if we go to the fourth dimension, then something interesting happens. In fourth dimensions, we have four maps. And now I have uh, 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 at least two possible choices where to choose my, my length two subcomplex. For to construct a stabilizer map, I only need two maps, not four. So one obvious choice, which is historically much more relevant, is again to think about <coughs> this part. Take a face. Uh, two-dimensional cell, a square, and assign sig product of four sigma z's around that square in four-dimensional space. And assign in such a way that it, it covers every possible faces. And then design your vertex term in such a way that this boundary map is interpreted as an excitation map. And the obvious choice is that you assign, you write down the product of a sigma x across all edges meeting at a one vertex. There will be eight of them. But this homology point of view allows us to think about other possibility. Uh, yeah. What about this? So I define a sigma z term for every three cell. 
well, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, it's a just a uh, simple cube, a three dimensional cube embedding the four dimensional space, which has six faces on it. Take a face, write down sigma z for each face. Now the degrees of freedom, the qubits are not on the edges but on the faces. And then design the sigma x term in such a way that taking the boundary will result in the excitation in the edges. So a sigma x term should be associated with the edges. And the obvious choice in this case is the you write down sigma x, product of sigma x on faces that shares one edge. It's hard to imagine, you know, in, in four dimensions, but there are six of them. So this is, in some paper, it is denoted by 2 comma 2 Tory code. And this one is 1 comma 3. It's 2,2. Two, two, two. Two, two. Uh, this is a discrete version of usual discrete gauge theory. This is somewhat more complicated. You, can, you may think of a higher form gauge field, but let's just stick with the discrete version. Why is it two, Sorry? Why is two, two, one? The meaning of the number. Um, Just a convention. Is <laughs> there's no deep meaning to it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the first two, well, each component actually is associated with the middle thing here. So one appears here, and that was the uh, the degrees of freedom. I'm sorry. That that was the the cell dimension of the cell where the qubits were lying. And in this case, that's the that's where the sigma z stabilized were associated. And three <coughs> would be just a dual version of that, where the sigma x stabilized will be defined. And yeah, uh, there's no deep meaning to this number. It's just a convention. An exercise, a mental exercise. You don't have to write anything. Just think about it, and then realize, aha. <laughs> um, show that. Uh, yeah, you can do the same thing here. So I could, well, following that convention, I, could, I should call this as a 1, 3, 1, 2, and this one. <coughs> they are related by the simple local unitary. Oh, uh, total dimension minus the first one. <laughs> yeah. Now let's think about this two comma two a little bit more carefully. Um, well, I cannot draw. I, I don't know how to visualize four-dimensional space, uh, but we can resolve to the just analogy from starting from the low dimension. The Logical operator was corresponding to the homology at this middle of the uh, length to chain. So in this 1, 3 Tory code, the number of logical qubits was the first the homology at this location. You take a kernel, take the image, factor it, count the dimension. And for the 2, 2, you, you compute the homology at this uh, second uh, dimension 2. And uh, um, but what are the representatives here? 
what are the, the geometric layout of your logical operator? Well, it should live on a, a two-dimensional sheet who, that does not have any boundary. And also, it, it does not come from the bound, taking a boundary of a three-dimensional cell. So it, I cannot, again, I cannot uh, draw it here, but I, well, I cannot visualize it either. But we can imagine that, imagine the, the, the geometry of that sheet to be just uh, by doubling the picture of a torus. We had a two-dimensional torus, and we had representative loop that goes around that torus, doubling up the dimension, and there will be some surface uh, that is not contractible in that four-dimensional space. Sorry? Is that a 3D surface? Is that 3D surface? No, it's, well, what do you mean by 3D surface? Is it a co-dimension one surface? Co-dimension two. Uh, this is code dimension, yes. <laughs> yeah, this is code dimension one, yes. But uh, here it should be code dimension two. Yeah. I know it's hard to, hard to imagine, but you, you just follow the mathematics. So that, that, that's yeah. for the two tutorial. Yeah, this is for the two tutorial. Yes. Oh, uh, so homology does not depend on your particular triangulation. So whenever you see a, 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 a square that is properly embedded, and uh, it's just the uh, just, you know, just same as the usual uh, square embedding in some R3 in this case, then you can remove any, res uh, any uh, fine structure in inside. So homology is insensitive to that. So the simplest possible cellulation of my three torus is just a simple cube where the uh, parallel edges and faces are, are identified. So that's my cellulation. And then, well, this is a finite data. You can just write down on a piece of paper explicitly, writing out all the basis elements, calculating all the boundary maps. And for this one, actually, the boundary maps are all zero. It's a particular property of this, uh, uh, this example. Uh, you can just you should work it out. Um, yeah, and then, well, if one map is zero, then kernel is everything. Image is nothing. So the quotient is the everything. So <laughs> um. Yes. There are different models. So they cannot be present at the same time? No, no. There are, there are just separate models. So for the one tree code, code the logical operators are labeled by H1? Yes. Uh, uh, the Z logical operators are labeled by H1. X logical operators are labeled by H3. Uh, so, so far, we've talked about examples. Let's talk a little bit about the generality. Uh, so that's a mental exercise involving topology. Now it's uh, another exercise involving linear algebra. Um, you didn't get the answer with the dimension. Sorry? You did not get the answer. Oh, 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 oh. In this case, it's, in this case, it's 4 choose 2, 6. Yeah. So how, how would you specify a surface in, uh, in, in, in some n-dimensional uh, space. You specify two court, two axes where the surface is spanned by, and you have uh, four different directions to choose from, and the order should not matter. So it's just a combinatorial factor for choose two. And in general, for any n-dimensional torus, that's true. So it's less dimension of the chain of, the, of C2. But Sorry? That's, that's the dimension of C2, but it's obvious that that's also the dimension of H2. No. C2 is, well, OK. C2 is, my, is associated with my cellulation. So it can be arbitrarily large. Right? It's the number of faces in your, in your lattice. So it's a huge number. 
But the factor, the homology, is just a, some small group. Yeah. Right, I guess the, the minimal C controller. Minimum. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, probably that's not true, but, uh, well, because you can, you can think of other relations that are possible. But although I don't have uh, any candidate to, to beat that count, but yeah, let's, let's be cautious. Um. Uh. I know you have heard about the error correction many times, but this is my favorite version of the uh, equivalence relations among the error correcting criteria. I will let you to show the equivalences among them, but I will verify one of the conditions for one of the models here. Um. So the set, set setting is this. I imagine some set of qubits. This is my set of qubits. And I'm going to forget about A. That's my error model. It's very weird. Errors does not occur everywhere. It's not stochastic. It's deterministic. But, and it occurs only on A. And it just replaces the A part with a completely mixed state. That's my error model. And A union B consists of all physical qubits of my code. And my code is just to specify one projector in that huge Hilbert space. Uh, and anything that resides in that subspace is regarded as a code state. That's my setting. Sorry? This is the Hilbert space of the, of the set of qubits. A, B denotes set of qubits. Pi, this is an operator acting on that huge Hilbert space. So uh, this is an operator acting on C uh, 2 times A. Oh, yeah, I, I needed that. So I only consider subspace code, not, nothing really fancier. And I also introduce some auxiliary system that may be entangled with my code state. You know, if you, if you imagine that your code is residing in some quantum computer, then you have implemented, you, you cannot embed all qubits into a single code. That's, a, that's probably too hard. Um, so I imagine that some subset of qubits are embedded in my some smaller code, which, can, which may be entangled with some other system. So I model the, all the rest but the code as an environment E. Okay, that's my model. <coughs> The first condition is trivial one. It's uh, almost definition. Uh, I say the erasure of A is correctable whenever it is recoverable. By recovery, precisely, I mean there exists some quantum channel, a completely positive trace-preserving quantum channel, such that whatever code state you give me, I trace out A part, and then I plug that the damaged state into my recovery operation, then that recovery re operation will give back the original one 
Exactly, without any error. That's definition, right? That's natural definition. The second condition says, I do not invoke any recovery. I just focus on the state. And the condition says, there exists a fixed state, <coughs> independent of my codes, such that whatever you give me, if I trace out the B part, not the, not the part that is erased by my error model, but the part I keep, if I trace out that part, then it becomes a product state. Well, rho e is not a pure state, but we, this is product state. So it's completely a uh, product state with a fixed part given by that existence. Omega is independent. The quantifier precedes the uh, for all. Yeah, yeah. There exists omega a such that for any uh, uh, code state, if I trace out b, it becomes a product state. Third condition does not involve the environment. It's just the property of the projector onto, on, onto my code state and says, if I conjugate an, any operator observable that looks at A part, restricted to the code state reveals nothing. C of OA is just a scalar constant. So overall projector, well, overall operator here is proportional to my projector. Oh uh, yeah 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 yeah. So so when, whenever I wrote I write row A B E, then I assume this one. Yeah. The fourth condition is, so this is a logical operator, meaning that it commutes with, the, with, the, with the my code state projector. So if I started with the code state acting by UAB, acting on the whole system, then I will end up in the code space again. I may have induced some, some transformation. Given such any logical operator, I could find another operator acting only on B, acting by identity on A, such that the action on the code space, they are equal. And uh, a big exercise, I, I wouldn't say it, it's easy. Big exercise is that They are logically equivalent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh no no. 
No, for, for, for all. All of us. Yeah. Uh, prob yeah. Exactly, yeah. Right. So one is just a definition. Two means that A, well, looking at A, you would learn n nothing. And it cannot be correlated with uh, anything else if you're restricted to the code space. Third condition re-expresses the fact that you will learn nothing in, by looking at A. Fourth condition may not be so obvious, but it just means that whatever you can do on the code space can be done acting on B. Nice path. Um, so, okay, so here are some, some, well, hints you can look at the papers, but <laughs> one and two, uh, write, down the, write down the equation in terms of fidelity. Invoke Ullmann's theorem, namely the, the fidelity of the two density matrices are, is the maximum overlap between the purified states, and use the von Neumann minimax theorem. There are, there are many optimizations go going on, and you and the two expressions will result in uh, uh, the, the different order of the optimization. And uh, uh, the, the objective function here is going to be linear, and the phenomenon minimax theorem just directly applies. So one and two equivalents are more or less, yeah, that's actually a hard part, but it's not that complicated. Uh, two and three, you just write down correlation function. Um, Four would imply one by looking at, uh, by trying to, um, well, I would show the equivalence between two and four. That's the easiest way. Okay, why, why, do, I, why do I speak of that? I want to uh, relate and use those uh, uh, criteria for error correction. Yes? Okay. A, A union B consists of all qubits in my code. So in the Tory code, Hamiltonian, that comprises the full system. E denotes for environment can be anything that can be correlated with your code state. No, pi code me, uh, selects particular subspace in the full Hilbert space of A union B. So in the Tory code example, pi code is the ground state subspace projector. Yeah, but so in the first statement, why would this um, projector acting on row A, B, E still give you A, B, the counts? So I think E will be the uh, Yeah, so pi does not act on E. But nevertheless, so pi can be just absorbed it. In other words, if you look at the Schmidt uh, uh, vectors, well, if you write down the basis expansion of this row ABE, then the AB part will be in the image of that projector. Yeah. Um, so, for the interpretation of A and B, does yeah. that mean that this is just some bi partition? Yep. Uh, no particular dimension. No. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, how can I check any of the properties for one particular example? Let's work that out. Um, I think this place is good way. Um, so let's show the condition number three for the Tory code. The Tory code has, well, as a, as a quantum error correcting code, 
has parameters like 2 times L squared, uh, 2 and L under the periodic boundary condition. So from the general theory of error correction, we know that up to L over 2 errors, we can correct it. In particular, we can tolerate the erasure of up to L minus 1 qubits. We can loss L minus 1 qubits, but still the encoding information is not damaged at all. That's from the general theory. But much more is true for this lo local Hamiltonian uh, 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 model. And that's, one, that's what I'm go going to calculate for you. So this is my Tori code. And this is my region A. I claim that this is proportional to the code state, code state projector. Why is that? Well, how, how, how would you solve such a problem? Uh, this is a linear equation on OAB. Uh, I'm sorry, OA. So if I had OA plus O prime A pi, well, then it is well, obvious. So, well, but this is important. It means that if I were to, if I could show this proportionality for some basis of operators, then by linearity, each term will be proportional to pi. What is what? O prime A. O prime A. Some, some operator. Yeah, I didn't specify. Yeah. yeah. If I verify the first equation for basis state, then by linearity, every term in your expansion will be proportional to pi. The sum will be proportional to pi. Therefore, arbitrary operator will be proportional to pi. What's your favorite basis? Polys. Yeah. So I can expand all any operator in terms of linear combination of some poly operator with some complex coefficients. So all I have to do is to verify this is proportional to pi. Now, what's pi? Do you remember the first exercise of yesterday? What's pi? Pi was sum of all elements in the stabilizer group as a multiplicative group. Now, if P anti-commutes with any of this, suppose that. Well, the well, <coughs> pi has a pi is, since pi is a projector, it has a special property that for any element in your stabilizer group. It, it just gets absorbed into it. So I can write down this as I could write down this way. Well, this is obvious. Now suppose P is anti-commuting with G. G could be anything. Just pick one that, that anti-commutes with P. Passing through this, it will get sign change. But this is 0. So in my summation here, any uh, basis element that, that had anti-commuted with anything in, in my Hamiltonian will just kill it off. And 0 is a proportional to anything, so we're good. What bothers us is the one that commutes with everything. 
So now we consider this with the assumption that P commits with every term in your Hamiltonian. So, but P was supported on A. There's nothing else beyond A. So it would have, in your original lattice, it may have occupied well, some, something like this. It may act on that. Now, um, yeah. now suppose, oh, oh, and then I also write down PA and PAX. A, C. I can always decompose that into a sigma x part and a sigma z part. That's not a problem. Well, and I look at the sigma x part per first, because if I consider the commutation relations, this part will can even commute with the plocket terms. This part will be problematic. And I, well, say I look at that part of PAX. This edge meets this plocket at one edge. So this plocket had a sigma z over there. What's the possibility of, for an x operator to commute with a sigma z? Identity, right? So PA, X part should not have any support on that edge. Well, now I look at this plocket. This plocket uh, meets edges two. And what's the possibility for a, a sigma X type operator to commute with the sigma Z tensor sigma Z? It is either identity or sigma X times X. If it's identity, we can just remove it and forget about that. If it is x times x, then we could multiply another stabilizer of sigma x type to deform that operator without affecting the action on the code space. So in, in either case, I could reduce the support of my operator. And by induction, the sigma x part must go to identity entirely. It doesn't mean that sigma a of x was identity. It just means that I could apply suitable stabilizers to make it support <coughs> zero. In other words, the original operator was a product of the star terms. Said differently, the original operator was anyway a product of terms that are already in the Hamiltonian. That was a stabilizer. The, sim the same calculation carries over to the sigma z part. You just test, you, you look at the commutation relation to the sigma x part, and then uh, uh, erase that operator using, yeah. Yeah, very good point. That's why my A was a disk. It, if, you, if you carefully, well, how, how can I, for, in the first place, start this analysis? I attacked the corner first. I didn't start with the bulk, right? And the reason there was a corner was precisely a reason that it did not contain any non-constructible loop. So anything that commutes with the Hamiltonian, well, anything that commutes with every term in the Hamiltonian, if the support is finite, that does not touch the boundary, must be uh, uh, must be a product of stabilizers. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Okay, so we're done. Uh, it is indeed proportional to pi. Some terms that don't commute just kills, killed off. That sometimes do commute. They always have eigenvalue plus one that we started with because they're in the code space. So this proportionality holds, and we have verified the number three. What was the condition, once again? A had to be some small enough region. Well, actually, it can be large, as long as it does not touch the boundary. <coughs> so 
although as a block code, the code distance is only linear system size, the Tori code can tolerate erasure up to this much. A can be as large as this large square. And that's typical for any uh, topological codes. Actually, I do not know any example that does not satisfy this property. If you can design such a thing under the assumption of translation invariance, that'll be awesome. But I, but I doubt that. <laughs> okay, now let's look at the fourth condition since we have verified uh, condition three. Look at the fourth condition. Since the code space is uh, non-trivial, there, there's at least some operator that acts on that code space. And we, have, we just have verified that the almost all qubits can be erased to tolerate the erasure <coughs> error. But the number four, condition number four says that whatever action I could do in the code space can be done by acting on the complements of that. In other words, whatever you can do on this uh, code space can be done by acting on this strip. Which is consistent because we know that the, the full set of logical operators consists of uh, loops and loops can be placed anywhere. In particular, loops can be placed here and here. That's all. Going to higher dimensions, if you give me a three-dimensional Tori code, the previous example, 1, 2, then it means that the bulk can, be, uh, can tolerate the erasure, erasure error, meaning all the action can be done on the ground space, can be pushed to the boundary. And in three dimensions, you are, end up with uh, three hyperplanes. All we need is just uh, any of the one, and we have verified number three. And, I, and this procedure generally works if, it is the, if, if the code was good. Yeah. So we have, a, we have a, some, some general statement. Um, If, 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 hap if it happens to be the case that your Hamilt uh, the ground space of your local Hamiltonian is a stabilizer code, and furthermore, it has a property that your bulk does not know anything about your uh, ground state, which is typical in, the, in, in any topological order system, then all possible action in your code space can be done uh, acting on the bound, uh, code dimension one subset. In other words, the code uh, uh, code distance is bounded by L to the D minus 1, where D is the space dimension. No, generally no. So it only requires to be independent of your code state. It does not say anything further. And indeed, omega a in this example should reproduce any correlation within this bulk. So it cannot be trivial. Uh, 
Okay, so let's now drive ourselves into the question of quantum memory. So we have seen examples, we have seen some general criteria, and from that we have derived some consequences specialized to the stabilizer code. So we understand something about the, the shape of the logical operator. And now let's get back to the original title of this lecture series, the quantum memory. So now let, let's ask what's a quantum memory? You want to encode some state vector some arbitrary uh, small dimensional state vector into a larger system. Let them let it sit there, let it time evolve, and then we wish to observe it and use it later for later use. So it generally has three steps. First, you need to specify to, to design a quantum memory. You need to specify how the inc how the information is encoded. <coughs> You could just repeat yourself. That's one encoding. You could just isometrically embed your state vector into one of your uh, Tori code state in the ground state. That's one encoding. So there could be some variety of encodings possible. And then we should consider the relevant noise model or the time evolution of your system. And we, we want to know physics about that, uh, the, the, the system that acts as a quantum memory. And then you must be able to read off. Well, it doesn't mean that you have to destroy your memory. It can be just that uh, you apply a certain op operator that is entangled with something else. The first step is more or less the definition of your quantum memory. It's, it's just a... Uh, um, there's not hardly any technicality pr pr problem. Time evolution is a physical modeling, so it depends on your physical system. And uh, we're, for, the, for the remaining 15 minutes and day after tomorrow, we're going to focus on the thermal uh, evolution. By thermal evolution, I mean uh, I imagine some physical system that is governed by its own Hamiltonian, coupled with some heat bath at some temperature. And then there is some interaction that would eventually thermalize this uh, small quantum memory system. But we want to look at the dynamics. The read-off part can be tricky, and it's highly depend on the all previous steps. If, you, if your memory has suffered from noise, you have to correct it before you use it. Otherwise, you are acting on a wrong state. So you're, you cannot rely on, on your later information processing. So you must de uh, 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 devise a certain decoding algorithm for this part. Without this, all the others doesn't really make sense. You cannot write a, you cannot invent a language one cannot read, right? And decoding algorithm can be anything. Uh, and if you are really uh, motivated by the quantum comp computing perspective, then you you would want to impose certain complexity assumption here too. If you're decoding a text exponential time, then it's not going to be viable option anymore. So it must be efficiently decodable. Um, ah. Okay, so let's consider a simpler case of classical memory. Uh, for the, yeah, yeah, we, and yeah, this time I will think. I think I will end with classical memory. Um, so, what's the most naive way that that would tolerate uh, an error in the classical regime? Just repeat yourself. Right. So, zero is embedded into zero 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 many times, and one is embedded into one 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 one. And if you have some message, then each symbol is repeated some number of times. As a physicist, we can model this as an Ising model. And these are 
all spins up state and this is all spin down state so I could write down a A simple physical Hamiltonian uh, that enforces that nearby bits are aligned. That's my uh, simplest possible Ising uh, uh, memory. Well, of course, you can go to the higher dimensions if you wish, but let's focus on one dimensional case first. Now, let's turn on the, uh, uh, the thermal coupling. Well, you could you could analytically be very precise how you do it, but let's, but for this purpose, it suffices to think about just uh, uh, doing the Metropolis algorithm on your simulation homework. Okay, you prepare your um, ground state that is all up say that's my encoding. So encoding is more or less fixed by writing this Hamiltonian and declare that my code space is is my ground state. Now consider the time evolution part. So uh, you prepare some array of in your in your favorite program language and randomly pick some spin and calculate the uh, and with the probability e to the beta energy difference you will flip this spin that's my metropolis evolution algorithm and we by experience we well yeah, that metropolis algorithm will often uh, lead my system to the thermal uh, 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 equilibrium state. So I'll just use that as my heuristic model for the thermalization process or interaction with the heat bath. And uh, yeah, well, and w after some time, if you pick a if initially spin was all up, there's some probability, some finite, some non-zero probability that it will get flipped. And the, the nearby one has equal chance of being, being, uh, uh, being the same or flipped. So in that process, you can think of some domain walls that corresponds to the excitation in this model that will propagate uh, freely. And whenever you want to introduce a new domain wall, you do it less less likely, but with some non-zero probability, you do it. So after order of L, time, L times exponential to beta, your coupling constant, after this number of steps, each spin will, will have some non-zero non -zero and finite probability of being flipped. So this number is rough estimate of your system to be thermalized. Well, uh, the factor of L is just the artifact of the fact that I'm doing my simulation where each time I flip only one spin. Sorry, what's the mean? Sorry, what's the mean? Uh, this is the number of Yeah, number of local iterations in your met metropolis algorithm to reach your thermal equilibrium, starting with the initial all aligned state. But this factor of L was an artifact, well, like I said, is an artifact of the fact that we are looking at one spin at a time. But realistically, the environment will look at the whole system at once. So we should scale this factor by L to mimic the to pr more properly model the uh, thermal interaction. This number goes exponentially large in the inverse temperature. So if you go to a low, no, low enough temperature, then b this big number might be enough for your memory purpose. But as a fundamental physicist, this is a, just a constant, given any fixed temperature. It does not scale with the system size at all, which translates to the, to the observation that if, if, my, if the, 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 the encoding scheme of this simple memory will lost all its memory about the initial state after that constant time.
what if I change my encoding? Not to the one-dimensionalizing model, but to two-dimensionalizing model. In the two-dimensional ferromagnetic Eisen model, two spins will want to align. And we know that any flip will introduce a domain wall. And any successive flip will enlarge my domain wall up to a certain length. And, and we know that there is some finite temperature phase transition, which in the metropo metropolis algorithm, the reason is that the number of ways to increase or fluctuate this uh, uh, domain wall is going to be only exponential in the length. Well, E is some, some constant. How do I know that? Well, for sure. Well, start with uh, some vertex. Choose any direction you want to go. And your, your budget is limited by the length. And you have to return. But regardless of that return condition, there are only like four choices each time you can make. And you can only choose L, up to L times. So the number of paths of length L is bounded by 4 to the L. So that's my number. But what's the probability of having such a configuration? It's a thermal ensemble. So it will be suppressed by the Boltzmann factor whose energy is proportional to L again. So if, well, in this expression, if beta is larger than log 4, then this exponential suppression, Boltzmann factor wins. And the probability that I will have a length L domain wall will be exponentially small as well. In the high temperature, when beta is smaller than log 4, then this estimate does not tell you anything. But for sufficient high temperature, it will be proliferated. So comparing these two uh, very simple classic examples, the lesson, main, main message I want to convey is that this Boltzmann factor, it depends upon the length of your excitation, well, the, the length of domain wall. Here, domain wall has only constant length. If you want to destroy your information, if you want to flip all the spins starting from up to down, then in the two-dimensional case, you should overcome this large energy barrier. But in the one-dimensional case, the energy barrier is just constant. And probably that's the essential reason that distinguishes the two situations. Now, let me end this talk by asking, what happens if I just have two-dimensional toric code? We concluded that all you can do can be done acting on a strip. Strip looks like a one dimension, similar to the one-dimensional Ising model. So I think we're screwed here. Uh, yeah, and let's continue the day after tomorrow. Thanks.